the most gangster tanker of World War II, Lafayette War Daddy Pool by the Fat Electrician. Before you ask, yes, this is in fact the guy that Brad Pitt's character in the movie Fury is based off of, and yes, the nickname War Daddy was real. I love this. It just doesn't Today surprise me. Today we're talking me. about the most gangster tank commander in American history, Lafayette Greenpool, his incredible crew, and their infamous M4A176 W Sherman tank, known by its moniker painted across the side in the mood. This video is brought to you by War Thunder, the best and most realistic vehicle hey, combat there video it is. game that has ever been made. This game has over 2,500 tanks, planes, helicopters, boats, and ships. Seriously, pretty much every vehicle that's been used in armed conflict from the 1920s until modern times is in this game. My favorite part about this game is the history Easter eggs and how realistic it is. For example, since we're talking about Lafayette Green Pool, we can actually go in, pick his exact tank, the M4A176, and then we can customize it to put in the mood on the side of it just like this. he had on his tank and then you can hop over to x-ray mode and see how much work they actually put into this game making x-ray versions of every single vehicle showing the crew and the different components of all of it and then they use this x-ray mode in gameplay so when you shoot at an enemy tank you're not just shooting at the tank until it blows up you can shoot the enemy tank and disable the tracks so you mm -hmm. can take out the engine you could kill a single member of the crew or you could take out the entire crew and the best part about all of this it's free on pc playstation and xbox Box. So if you decide you want to give it a try, I will have it linked in the description down below. And when you use my link, you're going to get a bunch of free stuff unlocked right off the bat. Vehicles, skins, in-game currency, everything you need to get started. So go check it out. Let's get back to the video. Once upon a I, I love this. It was very thematic, very quick, succinct, on point. So we're starting the video at about 1 minute 35. So it's probably a 60 second ad read. Like once again, furthering my statements in the past that sometimes you have ad reads that have a required amount of time. You must, for this ad read, dedicate X amount of time to the video. And so that's why long ad reads aren't necessarily a bad thing or they should be frowned upon. Like sometimes that is just requirements. And I like this. This is actually super cool. It was also thematic. The fact that he put in the mood on the side of that exact same tank. Super cool. I like it. There are people that will just dead ad read. They'll talk at the audience. Today we're being sponsored by this. And you know, this is why you should do it. Right? And it's soulless. I, I want to consistently just showcase good ad reads and commend people for good ad reads because honestly they're great and I absolutely love this. This this, this pause this pause champ. I'm so sorry, fat electrician. <laughs> but this was honestly very very good. I liked this and uh, yeah, War Thunder has a. Uh, is an interesting beast, so to speak. <laughs> July 23rd, 1919, two twins would be born, John Thomas Poole and his younger brother by five minutes, Lafayette Green Poole. Mm -hmm. They both spent their entire childhood growing up in Texas. The Great Depression happened when they were 10 years old. Despite oh. that, they were both star athletes in middle school and high school. And then when they graduated from high school in 1937, John and Lafayette, the two brothers, wanted to join the Navy together. Like mm -hmm. everything else they'd done in their life at this point, they go down to the local recruiting office together and they both sign up for the U.S. Navy. Then they go to get their physicals. John passes with flying colors, but Lay, on the other hand, is rejected because his eyesight isn't good enough because he has one bad eye from an injury from when he was younger, mm. which is turning into a weird pattern at this point <laughs> yeah. because there's a shocking amount of badasses that are originally rejected from the U.S. military for apparently having bad eyesight. I mean, off the top of my head, we've got Lawson Red Ramage, the first submarine commander mm. to earn the Medal of Honor, which I don't know why your vision needs to be super good inside of- Sorry, I was trying to, to blink out for a second to try and showcase them as a little slow. A Submarine, but whatever. Then we've got Willis Ching Lee, literally an Olympic sniper that was the greatest battleship commander of all time. That after he had won the Olympics for sharpshooting, was told that his vision wasn't good enough. <laughs> and then, of course, we have Jay Zemer, Medal of Honor recipient, the pilot of the most decorated air crew in U.S. history, that was also rejected because his vision wasn't good enough. And now we have Lafayette Greenpool, the greatest American tanker of all time, also being rejected because his vision just isn't quite good enough. Now uh, you know, that's one of those things that I, I'm very curious on the armed forces standpoint on, where I had a buddy, he was in, I think he was in the Navy. No, he was in the Air Force. He was on, he was on the deck of aircraft carriers working on planes and stuff. He had to have been Air Force, I thought. I don't think he was Navy. Anyways, but uh, yeah, he, uh <sighs> He was saying that, you know, oh, well, bad eyesight's not an issue. I guess, allegedly, there are ways, even with certain disqualifying factors, i.e. Uh, bad uh, genetics, uh, certain uh, certain issues. Like, like for example, like I, I, <laughs> a little chubby, if you will. And uh, something like that, you know, could be considered disqualifying if I don't meet certain things. My eyesight's awful. I can't see without glasses, really. So things like that are, you know, 
deciding factors. And, you know, if I were to go and try and enlist or something like that, allegedly, allegedly, uh, there are ways around this. So I'm very curious, though, in regards to is it similar to like standardized testing in U.S. public schools where you have to hit X, Y, Z metrics? And if you don't hit X, Y, Z metrics, even if you excel at like metric A, that doesn't matter because all that really is required is X, Y, Z. Is it looked upon favorably? Is it looked upon disfavorably just because you don't necessarily meet the criteria for one thing? And you, you could excel at another thing that is incredibly invaluable. But at the same time, as far as I'm aware, once again, civilian speaking here, there is kind of that expectation, if you will, like the scene from 300 where, uh, you know, the dude tries to be a uh, he, he tries to be a Spartan. Right. But, you know, he ends up getting cast out because, you know, oh, well, you got a Spartan is required to hold a shield at this height. You're, you're too small or something like that. There's the whole, that whole plot point. Like if you have your battle buddy or you have someone in your unit and they don't quite meet fitness standards. They don't quite meet something. Isn't wouldn't that be a liability? Like that's the reasoning I could see for having this sort of standardization. This is such a fascinating world to me because I'm a civilian and I've always been tangentially related in some capacity to military. Whether it's family that's been in military, friends that have been in military, people I've worked with that have been in military, you know, just been constantly been surrounded by it. And I just kind of like gravitate towards these circles, but obviously in a respectful fashion. You know, huge fan of not engaging in stolen valor because that's just dumb i'm very curious though i'm very curious about the standardization of this and uh what i guess public perception is on it well, that being said here's where pool is just a little bit different from those other heroes he's trying to join in 1937 world war ii has not kicked off no. yet so he's not overly motivated to join the military so unlike the other three he does not cheat on his eye exam to get in mm -hmm. he decides that he's just going to go off to college and become an engineer so that's what happens john ships off to go get trained for the navy lay decides he's going to stay around town he helps his parents out on the farm he mm -hmm. goes off to college to become an engineer and he also decides that he's going to start boxing to earn some extra money on the side and over the course of the next three years he never loses a single match because wow. he is an incredibly talented boxer. Then, September 16th, 1940, America decides to reinstitute the draft because World War II is looming on America. Because of this, Lay decides that he's going to try to join the military again, but he's concerned that the Navy still has records of him failing his vision test from a couple of years ago. So, instead, this time, he goes to an army recruiter, gets signed up, goes to the physical, and this time, he does what all great American heroes do. He cheats on that <laughs> eye exam and he passes. Seriously, the impact that a bunch of dudes cheating on the eye exam to get into the military has had on the world that we live in today is profound so pool ships off to training he i do think that there is a commentary here about the people that can make the biggest difference in the world are those that the world deems are unworthy of doing that if that makes sense right well your vision's too bad so therefore we can't have you do this except they end up finding a way to make it work through just sheer conviction, maybe even dumb luck, potentially, it, you know, here, nor, neither here nor there, though. Luck factor is a thing in many things. And they end up going to just become icons, legends, people that change the world. I, I feel that there's a commentary one could draw from this, or at the very least, one could draw parallels to other individuals throughout history that have done similar things. And, you know, even have a motivational T-shirt in regards to, you know, just do it. <laughs> Right. Not saying, not advocating to cheat on military exams and tests. I cannot legally say that. What I can say <laughs> is allegedly there may be potentially ways in if you're really convinced, uh, if you have that conviction, if you're driven enough. <laughs> at everything he does and then every time he gets leave he's always going out and taking boxing prize fights to win more money on the side so he finishes training gets assigned to the 32nd armored regiment where he rapidly becomes a sergeant and a tank commander again continuing to box every second he can wow. as world war ii ramps up the 32nd armored regiment's training gets more and more intense as they get put in different climates in different places all over the country they train in louisiana they train in pennsylvania and now they're out in the mojave desert in california yeah. and at this point Pools developed quite a name for himself. Everybody knows who he is. He's a six foot three boxer that's 41 and 0. He's never been defeated. And he is one of the best, if not the best tank commander that they have. That's and because of this, cool. he gets a little bit of sway with how things go. So he actually goes out and starts picking his own tank crew. And he picks the best of the best. In the driver's seat, he's got 24 year old private first class Wilbert Richards, AKA Baby, a nickname that he got when the crew was out for dinner one night at a diner. And the waitress looked at him and said, I didn't think they let babies join the army despite having a oh no i feel like that's such a military thing though like how you get your 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 call sign your nickname right oh man like that is a whole that is a whole thing and sometimes it just sticks 
and it, it, I don't. I view it as kind of an honor thing, right? You have to be in the military. It's not like I can necessarily say, "Hey, people in chat in the in the military, what what call sign would I be?" I feel that that'd be disingenuous to even ask if that makes sense. Like, I don't know. It, it's it's different, I guess. If there's like a meme and it's going in like a community night or something like that, but generally things like this are I re- regard in you know just high respect and make sure that uh, I'm being respectful of it because there, there are a lot of people that uh, did not go through a lot of what these uh, military personnel went through that want to claim that oh yeah well I'm this or you'll call me this right and you know sometimes it's not glamorous <laughs> sometimes you can just get stuck with the name baby sometimes you can get uh, stuck with the name like say reaper if you're a redhead or something like that some kind of soul joke right and that's kind of something that is just look you serve you're in the military you kind of get this the ability to do this and as a civilian you know i i can just kind of look on and respect it if that makes sense Baby face, Poole said that he was the best tank driver in all of World War II. He was so good that he could parallel park a Sherman tank in the middle of downtown New York during rush hour traffic. I love it. In the gunner seat, we have Willis Ollier, aka Groundhog, a nickname that he got in the Mojave Desert because he constantly wore his goggles and had dirt rings from the goggles around his <laughs> eyes at all times. He is the oldest man in the crew at 28 years old. He was a factory worker at an ammunition plant. He was exempt from the draft, but he wanted to go to war anyways, so much so that he had to go to the government to get permission to quit his job so that he could be in that tank that's wild. At loader we've got 21 year old delbert boggs aka jailbird a nickname that he got because he was allegedly there because the judge gave him the option of go to war or go to jail <laughs> standing at only five foot six 120 pounds Chad. jailbird had probably the most physically demanding job in the entire tank crew despite his stature he was able to load that gun faster than pool could say fire and then an assistant driver and bow gunner, we have Arthur Reed, who has not quite earned a nickname yet. The crew then decided that their fearless leader needed a nickname too. Poole was already becoming a legend. He was an undefeated boxer. He was one of the best tank commanders America had, and he made sure that everybody in his crew was squared away and taken care of at all times. He took complete responsibility for them. He was just like their dad, and for that reason, they gave him one of the coolest nicknames ever, and the same one from the movie Fury, War Daddy. You know, I think this is one of the things that modern civilian, specifically gaming culture, gets wrong. As we have, uh, there was a, a whole thing in 2023, the end of it. It was like people were complaining about stacking Call of Duty. Like big streamers, big names were complaining about people against them who were solo queuing playing as a team together and i just i just the absurdity of this statement just because how many games have you played battlefield uh, uh <laughs> i'm just, sorry i'm totally blank there battlefield call of duty socom i hear socom is actually very very popular with uh military members i hear it's very good and i hear it's very challenging because they just know what they're doing arma 3 etc right how many games you know have you gotten into and it's just like well you're against a uh halo even right you're well you're against a six stack <laughs> have fun being on respawn all game and i think that's what there, there's a large misconception about the power of an individual versus the power of a group and that's why you know you have an entire unit like this right where you have uh groundhog where you have baby where you have jailbird where you have you know war daddy right you you have all of these people working in tandem with each other literally being able to load it faster than he can say fire you can trust that that person will have that job done and you don't even have to say it right and you're close and tight-knit enough that it's not an issue that is what i respect and there's this whole thing I mean, you could argue that it's pop culture media games you know you could argue that it's many things like that movies even that are the power of individuals all that matters i'll just go john wick right but realistically i the, the true strength lies in being able to work with a team you as one person can only do so much even if you say have multiple 100 round 556 drum magazines right you can only fire and reload it so quick versus they have a buddy or have some teammates hey you know here take this right and, and I'm, i don't know how it works in the field necessarily that is not my area of expertise and i encourage conversation in the con- comment section in regards to those that have had to go through it during you know in uh, desert storm in afghanistan you know uh in drills etc I, I encourage that discussion because you know 
I think that there's a lot that a civilian can learn from the military, not necessarily to emulate or to, you know, steal valor, but why does it work? Why does a team like this work? Why is this impressive? Why are we even talking about this today? As a civilian, even if you're not emulating the military in itself, look into it and learn why we're talking about this and why it's so cool. The best question you can ever ask in life is why. That question alone will gain you more knowledge than you could ever hope to read. Well, learn in general. Just ask. Ask why. <laughs> Unlike the movie, however, Poole did not decide to name his tank Fury. He gave it a nickname that is a thousand times cooler, and Hollywood decided to change for no good reason because they yeah. named their tank In the Mood. When asked what that <laughs> meant later, Lafayette simply said, that's just how I felt at the time. Yeah. I was in the mood. Yeah. So we've got the crew, we've got the tank, <laughs> everybody has a cool nickname. It's time to get ready for war. They start training together super hard and become one cohesive unit. At this point, Poole, who's still been going out and boxing every chance he can, ends up joining the Golden Gloves tournament and he actually ends up winning and becoming a Golden Gloves champion, which qualifies him for the national tournament in Chicago. At this point, the army is willing to let him take leave and go participate in this national tournament because it looks really, really good for the US military right. if they have an active duty sergeant that's a tank commander mm -hmm. that's winning national titles for boxing. Right. Poole, however, decides against it because he has his crew, he has his tank, and he's not going to let them go off to war without him. So he I decides to it. forego his dream of becoming a national Golden Glove boxing champion and instead goes off to war. Because I feel that that is actually the... Uh, not more respectful. It, that is that is a bigger play, though, and it speaks more to credibility and dedication, potentially. Because like, you're given, you know leave of absence you can go and do this right and yes it looks good for the u.s armed forces it's a you know if he wins it's a w for the military but it's also incredibly awe-inspiring and is a move in its own right to refuse especially if at the tournament hey unfortunately he is unable to compete because of the active ongoing war situation you know let's uh, let's take a moment thoughts and prayers for this man right that kind of thing in a, in a civilian tournament setting and how many people would that inspire like man this man is off fighting the good fight, fighting a war. And, you know, yeah, it sucks because we wanted to see him here, but how just inspirational that can be and how many other people it could call to serve as well, right? I think in its own right, being able to refuse a champion like that is such a power play. And to the right people, it's absolutely inspirational. Of that, he is then offered a slot as an officer, which he also refuses because he doesn't want to leave his crew. He Dude. decides that he's going to keep being an NCO so he can be a tank commander and go out with his guys. Shortly after that, they would all ship off to England in 1943. Once they get to England, they just keep training, getting ready, waiting for orders. And then in April 1944, a famous boxer by the name of Joe Lewis, aka the Brown Bomber, comes over for a morale mission where he's going to box with some of the troops, you know, get everybody ready for war get him hyped up, doing something cool. And guess who gets slotted to fight him? Yeah, Lafayette Poole boxes Joe Lewis two months before <laughs> D-Day. And if you don't know who Joe Lewis is, he's literally one of the greatest boxers in the history of the world. This dude has 69 wins with 52 knockouts. Wow. He has one of the longest reigning title runs ever. He is the on man. a different level yeah. than Lafayette Greenpool, for sure. Despite that, everybody's hyped. The entire regiment is going to show up to watch War Daddy go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Brown Bomber, and it's going to be the coolest thing that's ever happened. So they have this boxing match, and you have to understand, this is a recipe for disaster because Joe Lewis is just over here trying to do the right thing, help with the war effort, raise morale of the troops before they go off into battle. Right. You know, he's being really cool about this whole thing. He's going from unit to unit, and he's boxing a new army guy every night for, like, months straight so i mean uh -huh. this is nothing more than a glorified sparring match to him he's not going that's super cool though could you imagine if you will say in a, a next deployed conflict right you had like taylor swift right or uh sabaton that just ended up touring to a bunch of uh a, a bunch of outposts and stuff and bases and doing concert and stuff there right can you imagine but will that necessarily happen no like that is wild to consider just from like a morale standpoint and just like, Hey, let, let, let's, let's get you motivated. Let's, let's get you going. That's wild to consider. Like, wow, that is so cool. But that I don't, I, I think that there are a few modern celebrities, modern musicians and stuff that would do it. 
I don't know that all of them would, or that a lot of the uh, the top ones would ever be want to do that. And they're trying to actually hurt the army guy. Hopefully the army guy's not going on to hurt him. He's just going out there to put on a show. Right. Cole, on the other hand, remember, just gave up his dream for a national title in boxing so that he could go to war. And now the world heavyweight champion is there and oh, he no. gets to box him. So in the back of his mind, there's got to be a part of him that's just like, I mean... Maybe I could take this guy. So Poole goes in there obviously wanting a real fight. And that's exactly what he got. Yeah. The match starts. Joe Lewis goes in there. He's dancing around. He's pulling his punches. He's putting on a show. He's being super nice right. to Poole. And then the first chance Poole got, he threw a hard punch and Ooh. just cracked Joe Lewis. Allegedly stumbled him a little bit. And then Joe Lewis tied up with Poole and whispered in his ear, I'm going to teach you a big lesson. The ref <laughs> then broke him apart, and Joe Lewis proceeded to beat the shit out of Poole in front of the entire <laughs> regiment. Poole is later quoted as saying that he was turned any which way but loose by the Brown Bomber. Now, the silver lining is that Poole somehow managed to not get knocked out, which is an yeah. achievement in itself going uh -huh. up against Joe Lewis. And just so we're clear, if you're not familiar with combat sports, Joe Lewis is absolutely not being a dick right now. This is 100% expected. This is how everybody acts in that situation. And Lafayette Poole knew that's how this would go down the minute he decided to crack him because he had like 40 plus boxing matches he knew what he was getting into yeah. he got exactly what he was looking for and it's absolutely hilarious and in war daddy's defense it is actually way cooler to say i got in a legitimate fight with joe lewis and survived even yeah. though i got my ass beat than it is to say i had a glorified sparring match with joe lewis one time and pretty we, we actually see this in sports i can't speak to like acl and hema but uh in sca right so you have to call your shots right even when doing heavy even in armor you know honor system you have to call your shots right and there's a certain level of think like even just translating it to a punch right you have to land a punch and the punch has to have a sufficient amount of force behind it to be considered a valid hit right so you come in and you know with a halberd or something in heavy right a, a legal halberd for the format and you wrap somebody you just you know smack them on the side and they go no it wasn't valid i, I didn't even feel it right okay Hit him, you know, hit him again. Oh, that's not valid, right? And if they're being a dick about it, right? I mean, there is the potential. It's just, what do you do at that point? Do you keep letting them try to take shots at you? You keep deflecting, parrying, avoiding, and they keep saying, oh, no, it's not valid. Or do you kind of just say, well, I mean, I'm about to teach you a big lesson. Then you, <laughs> you whack them and send them flying two feet, right? Like... I mean, obviously, in a safe capacity, I can't advocate for actual violence. And if a situation like that comes up in any sport, ACL, uh, HEMA, SCA, Bellagarth, uh, what was the one? Um, Adrian was part of it. Adrian Empire, right? Stuff like that. You should always be. You should always know that you can call upon a marshal if need be like, dude, he's not calling his shots, right? And, you know, the marshal can talk to them. And, you know, if they're really not calling their shots, they will deal with it. At least that they should. But though this is 100% just a thing. And I, I have immense respect. It's such a power play, right? To go in just to crack somebody like that, right? And then just to whisper, I'm about to teach you a big lesson. Or my personal favorite is uh, <laughs> when you... When uh, you're, you're boxing or something like that, right? And heard stories, you know, person boxing. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they're, they're just going to town. And then there's that pause. And then the person that was, you know, taking all the punches up until now goes, all right my turn and that, that's all right we we've entered a different stage of combat numbers are about to go higher those dice are about to get a lot of bonuses <laughs> you're about to take a lot of damage and stuff like that absolutely happens it's not malicious it's not mean it's not any sort of you know being a bully it, it, a lot of the times it's just matching energy right if i'm in say sca right and somebody starts moving at say if they're moving at like 25 50 percent speed for forms and stuff like that or, or we're trying to do something where maybe a little un, a little under armored if you will like we're just doing form stuff we shouldn't actually be hitting each other and a uh you know a person ends up just going faster and faster and you keep telling them it's like hey you know why are we continuing with this can you can you not please and they do. Sometimes you just have to match energy. So, in summary, yeah, a lot of times it doesn't mean as somebody that does things like SCA. Sometimes you just have to match that energy. Sometimes you just have to be like, all right, I see what you're doing. It's my turn now. Much everybody else agrees, and this serves to grow Poole's reputation even more. Fast forward two months, June 23rd, 1944, War Daddy and his crew would arrive at the beaches of Normandy 
two weeks after yeah. D-Day. For the next five days, they would make their way to the front lines following the trail of destruction left by the Allied forces before them. And on the sixth day, June 29th, 1944, they would go out on their first mission, attempting to drive the enemy further back. Using a combination of tanks and infantry, they would drive off the main road through crop fields, and they would cut through the different fields, and each field was divided by this thin row of trees mm -hmm. and bushes that was called a hedgerow. As they go through field after field and have the tanks drive through hedgerow after hedgerow, making a path for the infantry, they would come through another hedgerow where seemingly nothing was any different. As they continued to oh, advance no. through the field, Mines? as soon as they reached the midway point, the two corners of the hedgerow they were in up ahead of them would open fire. They had walked oh, directly no. into a German anti-tank unit's ambush as they began taking fire from anti-tank guns, machine guns, and Panzerfausts, or tank punchers which were an early German rocket launcher designed to take out Allied tanks. The Germans were so well camouflaged in the hedgerows ahead that they couldn't even be seen. The only thing they could fire at was the muzzle flashes mm. of the Germans firing at right. them first. As the Americans began to return fire, In the Mood was struck by a Panzerfaust, but it was deflected off of its armor because oh, they wow. were too far away when they fired it. And then a second, and then a third, and then a fourth. In the Mood had been hit with four tank fists and survived all of them. The American tanks... That's... That's metal AF. I don't care what anyone says. You took four pans. Oh, both just deflected. You took four Panzerfaust and just kept going. Can we just respect that for a minute? Like, oh my God including in the mood, attempted to drive forward to push through the ambush. But as they closed the distance between them and the German anti-tank unit, they came into the effective range of the tank punchers. Right. In the mood and 17 other M4s would be hit and knocked out. As Poole ordered his crew to bail out, he would come to the realization that his bow gunner and assistant driver, Arthur Reed, had been killed in action oh. on impact. With so many tanks knocked out, the entire unit was forced to retreat. And in a matter of minutes, Poole's entire battalion had lost 25% of its men, 177 soldiers, and 18 tanks. So that's a travesty. Oh, and so how do you, at that point, how do you damage control? I, I, from a military perspective, if I had to think about it as a civilian, I mean, if you're having to bail out at that point, I, I'm assuming that you would use the uh, now defunct tanks, right? You would use the the tanks that are inoperable as cover to try and make a getaway. You would you would use them as cover, uh, probably storm some sort of escape plan if you didn't have an escape plan already, which I'm assuming you potentially would, and uh, try and file out that way. Or, I mean, you could uh, you could use it as effectively destructible cover because eventually, I'm assuming the Panzerfaust and other uh, ordnance will end up punching through and destroying the tanks at some point. Do you make a stand there? There are people in the military that are paid way, way better than I am and have way more education than I am to make these decisions. The, the thought process intrigues me. I'm never going to claim to be military because I'm not. The thought process intrigues me, and I would love to understand the thought process just because it's... If you're in a situation, if you get into some, some deep, deep shit, right... How do you get out of it? How do you save the most people? If you can't save everybody, save the amount of people that you can and, you know, do everything you can. And I think that was the big misconception on Wake Island. And I wanted to just like address that really quick. The Wake Island reaction I did where I didn't understand something. And I, you know, I feel I had clear, uh, just incorrectly addressed my standpoint as a civilian and especially with having a bias towards saving everyone and anyone as much as possible, which once again, there are military personnel that are paid way better than I am and more, far more educated than I am that have to deal with this. And at the end of the day, I'm not the one that has to leave, you know, live with the consequences of a decision, whether that be bad consequence and losing more men, whether that be a good consequence and, well, we only lost X percent of people, you know, I, I don't have to deal with those. And I'm thankful I don't have to deal with those. It is not something to take lightly. Pool's unit falls back to the rear and they begin consolidating, figuring out how many people died, how many tanks they lost, refitting, getting reinforcements, getting everything done. And Poole receives word that his tank, while it was knocked out, is salvageable mm. and it's going to be up and running in a couple of weeks. At this point, yeah. most tank crews would be like, cool, I'll take a couple of weeks off hanging out back here, not getting ambushed. But War Daddy and his crew are absolutely furious that their friend was just killed and they want to get back in the fight right. now, not in two weeks. So Poole demands a new tank and his chain of command seeing that their golden boy wanted a new tank turns and says here you go and they give him their very first version of the new sherman m4 the m4 a176 w mm. with an even bigger gun that's more capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with german tanks that's they're then cool. immediately given a replacement bow gunner and assistant driver by the name of burt close a 19 year old kid that looks like he just got out of a high school classroom and Probably for did. that reason he is immediately given the nickname schoolboy as they paint in the mood too down the side of their new tank <laughs> 
and go back into the fight. Poole said he learned more in that first three minutes of combat than he did in the three years of training prior to that. He took note of how the Germans put their main anti-tank guns in the corners of the hedgerows to triangulate fire at the middle of the field, and they waited Makes until sense. they got into the middle of the field before opening fire so they couldn't retreat back into the hedgerows easily. Right. For that reason, every time they cut through a hedgerow, they would immediately use the main gun and fire on each corner ahead of them and then rake everything in between with machine gun fire, attempting to ambush the enemy first. And wow. this extremely slow, painstaking form of combat went on for the first month, just field after field, ambush after ambush, fight after fight. It took them a month to go five miles further into enemy territory. It's a game and this wasn't inches. just Poole's unit. This was the entire military fighting tooth and nail for every inch of land that they got. Because of this, General Omar Bradley decided to launch Operation Cobra on July 25th. The plan was to bomb the enemy first and then bomb the enemy again and again and again <laughs> and then roll in with tanks and take care of whatever's left. Yeah. On July 26, 1944, Operation Cobra will reach its apex when 3,300 Allied bombers dropped 14,000 tons of bombs in the span Wild. of three hours. Just for the record, so we're all clear, 14,000 tons is over 30 million pounds in three hours. With all the bombings wow. breaking down the enemy line, the combat pace really picked up as In The Mood started traveling miles a day instead of miles a month. Mm -hmm. During that time, In The Mood 2 would come toe-to-toe -to -toe with its first German Panther tank, and it would take it out in a single shot with its new and improved 76 millimeter cannon. Nice. From that moment on, War Daddy, his crew, and In The Mood 2 led point on pretty much every single mission his unit ran, and he was driving the enemy back as fast as humanly possible. In the following days, it became pretty apparent to pretty much everybody that War Daddy and In The Mood 2 were in fact the main characters of this story mm -hmm. as he began sitting up higher and higher in his commander's position on the tank pretty soon the other tankers began to describe it as he was sitting so high up on the tank that it looked like he was riding it like a bull showing off his <laughs> cowboy boots over the next several weeks they put so many miles on in the mood too and drove through so many hedgerows that they wore out the engine and it oh, needed wow. to be replaced and at this point pool being who he is is like i'm not waiting for that thing to get fixed just give me another tank so i can keep fighting and right. the chain of command is like actually that's perfect because now your original tank is fixed so you can just have that one back <laughs> oh no god pool immediately is like no absolutely not it's older it's slower the gun is smaller and most importantly my friend died in the assistant driver's seat yeah. and i don't want to look at that for the rest of this war i'm not taking that tank he was then given a direct order to take the tank to which he's like okay Fine. He then right. orders the rest of his crew to go over to In The Mood 2 and observe it getting fixed by the mechanics and having a new motor put in it, which is weird because they're not getting that tank back anyways, so why on earth is he doing that? In reality, oh, no. he just wanted to make sure that his crew was somewhere so they couldn't get blamed with what he's about to do. So he goes over... <laughs> I feel like we're about to uh, allegedly, potentially, strategically and tactically acquire some stuff and transfer it to an alternative location. And uh, there's definitely some alleged plausible deniability here. <laughs> Look, I keep telling people, if you want something done, just ask the military. <laughs> it might not, might not be done as pretty as you want. Oh boy, it'll get done though. <laughs> by himself picks up his new tank and then proceeds to immediately drive it directly into a lake nice i mean technically we don't know that for sure Allegedly. the only official documentation as to what happened to this tank is from the maintenance crew and it says and i quote the vehicle was believed to have been driven into a lake yeah it was believed to be yeah and at this point the yeah it, it was it allegedly just ended up in a lake somewhere i don't know how it happened it's just i don't know it's just, just gone chain of command is just like i okay well i mean let's hold on this is the golden boy. I don't I don't want to get rid of him. Hear me out. He did just save a tank the other day that we were going to lose. He ran in front of a bunch of machine gun fire and got that tank back. So now that he threw this tank away, it's basically a net zero. I think we should just let it slide. <laughs> Go ahead and give him a new M4A176W again, and we'll get him back on the front lines. And that's yeah. it. That's the whole story. They give him a new tank, and he goes back to fighting. Okay, do you understand how incredibly gangster that is? It's this so is gangster. an entire another level of plot armor, okay? Yeah. Going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the enemy and, like, doing some crazy stuff and surviving, that's one level. Going toe-to-toe yeah. -to -toe with Uncle Sam about his money is a completely another level of plot armor that most people can't even fathom. For example, when you go to get out of the military, they make you turn in every piece of equipment they ever gave you, ever. Okay, they're going to pull out a sheet of paper that's this long 
long with yeah. a list of all of it, and it's going to be the most ridiculous stuff on the planet. They're going to be like, yeah, we gave you a uh, a marker tube type in 2003. <laughs> what the fuck is a marker tube type? Oh, a Sharpie. You gave me a Sharpie in 2003? Okay, I'll just pay for it. How much does the government pay for Sharpies? Um, $79.95 is Makes what we sense. pay for fucking Sharpies around here. God, can anyone corroborate this? That's, how, that's highway robbery. Oh my God. That is excessive. That is insane. <laughs> God. Oh my God. That's... that's even at a markup premium for convenience and restocking, right? That is insane. Well, I also am curious, and I wonder if someone has the answer to this. I ended up going to a pawn shop locally recently, and I mean, we're talking like uh, there was like a medical like uh, Molly vest and helmet and stuff that looked like it was military, and it was just it just got pawned in. I guess the dude had served. I think it was in Afghanistan, and I'm like, I thought they made you turn all that stuff in. I mean, I guess maybe if you bought your own magazines like Magpul magazines, maybe not. But yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know how military turn in works. So this is just another aspect of the military. That's just super fascinating and apparently incredibly just financially draining. That's insane. And then you have to pay the government $79.95 for a Sharpie that you lost 20 years ago. Otherwise, they negatively impact your credit score. Wow. The rest of us mere mortals are over here getting harassed by the U.S. military because we lost a canteen cup at some point. Meanwhile, War Daddy's over here waterboarding an entire tank and just walking <laughs> away like nothing happened and nobody cares. Yeah. This is an unprecedented level of plot armor. So yeah. that's August 16th. He gets his new tank in the Mood 3. August 17th, the very next day, they come into a humongous battle. They catch up with an entire German armored unit that has 12 Panther tanks. Luckily, the Allied forces at this point in time have air superiority, so they radio in for some planes, and they come in and they bomb the entire Panther unit. Mm -hmm. Then, after the planes drop a bunch of bombs all over them, then all of the American Sherman tanks start to advance. And then a couple minutes later, another group of American planes come. They were either P-38s or P-47s, depending on which source you want to read. Doesn't really mm -hmm. matter. Either way, American planes come, and then they proceeded to bomb everybody the american tanks included and during this wow. bombing run in the mood three and the tank next to it would both be hit luckily nobody in war daddy's crew would be hurt however both of the tanks were knocked out no. at which point the battalion commander orders everybody to fall back because things have just went catastrophically wrong pool orders his men to all bail out and run back baby the driver and jailbird the loader both cool dope they hop out of the tank they run back it is now pool and schoolboy left inside this tank the mm -hmm. other tank right next to in the mood three also bails out and they all run off however one of those crew members is hurt and they're laying on the ground war daddy sees this hops out of his tank runs over to try to save this guy drawing all of the machine gun fire from the German side mm -hmm. on In the Mood 3. War Daddy ends up making it over to this other tanker and helping to save him. However, Burt Close Schoolboy is now pinned down underneath In the Mood 3. So he just digs in and buries himself underneath the tank, yeah. hoping that he's not Actually. hit by enemy machine gun fire or an American plane. So that's all he does. He just lays. I mean, he just makes himself a smaller target. It's not that he can fully mitigate that. And I mean, a large enough round, I'm sure, is will is, will can deflect or punch through. Just I'm sure there's a number of things that could go wrong there. Or I mean, the tank could probably just explode if hit right, right? Like, no, that's the yeah. I mean, what else do you do in that situation? Make yourself a small target, dig yourself in, and just I guess wait for it, the situation to resolve itself. I mean, at the very least, it's the most just intelligent decision I can come up with. That makes sense underneath the tank and kind of buries himself in the dirt and he waits and he waits listening to the machine gun fire bounce off his tank as he hears american bombs exploding in the background mm -hmm. and he just waits and 10 minutes go by and suddenly somebody runs and dives under the tank and it scares <laughs> the shit out of burt close and he looks over it's an american so he kind of relaxes for a second but that dude doesn't see burt yet and burt close schoolboy recognizes this guy it was his friend from basic training that he hadn't seen in oh like my two God. years and close remembers on the first day of basic training this guy got asked a question by the drill instructor and he told the drill instructor i don't know and from that point on throughout the rest of their training that particular drill instructor would always tell this guy what do you know? Bearing that in mind, <laughs> Schoolboy asks the guy, hey, what the hell happened? And that guy responds, I have no idea. To which Schoolboy responds the what same thing know? the drill instructor would have responded. <laughs> 
what do you know? Amazing. And that guy whipped his head around, recognizing the voice of his friend, and they were reunited after like two years not seeing each other, That's not knowing wild. that they were alive. They've just ran into each other in the most unfortunate circumstance on the planet, and then they just hung out for the next hour in the middle of this firefight, catching yeah. up, because there's literally nothing else they could do, and it's the most army thing I've ever heard ever. So while Close I is catching up it. with his buddy, War Daddy makes his way back to safety. He carries that injured tanker with him, and then he realizes that he's missing Burt Close, schoolboy, and he was not about to lose another assistant driver and bow gunner, and he is ready to run back into hell to go get him too. He is then physically restrained and given a direct order to not. So like an hour goes by, Schoolboy and his buddy are just chilling underneath the remnants of In the Mood 3, waiting <laughs> for the bombs to clear up. Finally- Why is that such a mood though? I feel like that's one of those, what is the, the meme that's been going around recently? Men will just look at this and go, hell yeah. And it's like, like some picture of like a, a high caliber uh, sniper or something like that or just something super cool that th this this is that meme just like mental like look about that look at this and think hell yeah just two buddies d entrenched under a tank in the middle of a firefight just chilling <laughs> The German armor units forced to retreat. They get the all clear. The planes aren't going to be coming anymore. And then they just kind of get out from underneath the tank and walk back and everything's okay. Yeah. So now the next problem is it in the mood three is gone. They no longer have a tank. Well, by that time, they had already replaced the motor and in the mood too, and they were ready to hop back in that. So mm. the next day, August 18th through August 26th, War Daddy and the crew of in the mood two go ham. They spearhead every single mission, driving further and further into enemy territory, wrecking absolutely anybody that gets in their way. Poole and in the mood three are leading the entire third armored division deeper and deeper in enemy territory. And during this point of the war, the third armored division earns the nickname, the spearhead division, because they are leading the rest of the military military into the fight because they are advancing so rapidly. It is literally the largest unhealth care system in the world being spearheaded by War Daddy and his crew of In The Mood 2. <laughs> they are pushing so hard so fast in enemy territory that they start getting direct orders from the battalion commander to slow down and let everybody else catch up. Mm -hmm. There's accounts of In The Mood 2 taking out entire infantry companies by themselves. Wild. 250 men in a single day. And somehow, presumably divine plot armor, despite the fact that they are the first and sometimes the only one into a fight, they go completely untouched every single time. Then, August 27th, they come across a major set of train tracks, at which point they're all like, hmm, train tracks. I got an idea. Let's line <laughs> the tanks up and wait. And that's what they did. And they waited. And they waited. And like eight hours later, here comes a German train full of all types of cargo and equipment and tanks and oh, armored no. vehicles rolling down the tracks. And a bunch of Sherman tanks just opened fire, turning the entire thing into a shooting gallery, destroying absolutely everything on this train. <laughs> At which point, Poole is like, cool. Now that I know which direction the trains are headed, I'm gonna go get the next one. And he takes off heading the opposite direction that the train is gonna be coming. So he's gonna catch this train before anybody else. And sure enough, like an hour later, here comes another train headed in the exact same direction. <laughs> it is now in the mood two and this train going head to head as in the mood two starts firing 76 millimeter rounds into the engine of the locomotive. After two shots, it completely destroys the locomotive engine as the rest of the train glides to a halt as they pull around in the rest of the so that's something to actually consider as well in regards to warfare embargoes blocking supply lines because that's actually a super big thing you could it, it, you know, in history you've had entire armies and forces that have starved an enemy out of resources they have you know uh put embargoes they've cut resource supply chains etc so if you you know found this railroad track and you end up taking out a train even just a train right it's not like you're necessarily taking that train off the rails. I mean, the explosion could absolutely derail that. But, I mean, wouldn't that be just an artery that would be super easy to sever? I mean, I I'm trying to find, a, like, another equivalent. I mean, like, I guess if you had, like, a, mo a freeway or something like that, and you ended up, uh, you know, setting up on a freeway, and there's an entire convoy, you know, it's similar to World War II style, right? An entire convoy of... Uh, you know, German vehicles coming down and you just take them all out and you block the road, would that not cause a disruption to the supply chain issues? Like, this is just one of those logistical factors that you look at and go, okay, that's fine. You take out a few tra uh, trains on this singular train track and it's not like a train can stop <laughs> and not on a dime, at least. I mean, it can stop, but you have to have enough stopping distance to do that. And what happens if there's just this, you know, derelict and destroyed train or ruins of a train on or across the track? 
would that not cause more of an effect? I mean, obviously, and at some point, some word will get back and trains will get stopped being sent on that route. So you could kind of milk it for a little bit, right? But that's just one of those things in warfare that I, that's just like, I mean, this, assuming this is legal, at the very least, I haven't heard anyone say it's a war crime. <laughs> it also isn't a war crime the first time. <laughs> it comes into view. There are four German Tiger II tanks on this train. They haven't even ran into one of these in combat yet, and there's four of them sitting dead on this train, but Wild. the Germans are running to get in the tanks to use them as artillery and get the guns aimed at In the Mood II, and one of those German guns will absolutely destroy In the Mood II probably with a single hit. Mm. At this point, Schoolboy starts using his 30 cal machine gun and War Daddy starts using the 50 cal up top to shoot at these German Tiger tanks, not because it's actually gonna hurt the tanks, but because all the machine gun fire is keeping the Germans from getting inside of them to be able to use them. And it's suppressing fire, right? Can you necessarily advance if you have a bunch of 7.62 flying over your head, right? Or is it okay, like, or, or for example, even if it's on the other side of things, right? If you're trying to prevent a force from advancing, right? Or you're trying to keep them from, I don't know, Call of Duty style, throw a grenade, bring out an RPG, try and quick scope with an intervention, right? Do you just focus on where you know they're at? And even if you hit something, accuracy by volume of fire, right? You, you, and even if you listen, don't hit anything, they, they can't do anything or else they risk popping up and suddenly their helmet goes flying, right? Using game terms because YouTube. <laughs> This is something, yeah, absolutely. I mean, accuracy by volume of fire, but also suppressing fire are incredibly useful. If you can prevent them from furthering their own game state, you're doing your job. You're doing something to further your own goals. While that's going on, Groundhog is opening fire on the tanks with the 76 millimeter over and over, finally being able to break through the Tiger tank's armor, destroying all four God. of the tanks as they continue to destroy everything else on this train. For the next half hour, it is a complete shooting gallery is in the mood to wreaks havoc on this now defenseless train. At some point, the rest of the tanks catch up and they chip in too, but the majority of the credit ends up going to in the mood too. When the smoke clears, they make sure all the Germans are gone and then they go in and see what else if there's any cargo that's salvageable, hoping right. for like, I don't know, German chocolate or food or most importantly, booze. And they go yeah. in and they start looking at all the cargo and it's an entire train besides the tanks and a couple armored cars that were on there. All the cargo is just like French lingerie and fancy <laughs> perfumes and a bunch of woman stuff. Basically, they figured the Germans were just loading up trains full of anything they could find of value inside of France and trying to ship it back by rail to Germany to extract as much value as possible as they were being forced oh, to wow. retreat. Now, right. here's the silver lining. Somebody had the brilliant idea of like, hey, it's not food and it's not beer, but uh -huh. hear me out. Oh, no. The entire third AD is on its way to Belgium right now. And if we show up in Belgium and we give all the ladies there a bunch of French lingerie and perfume, we're gonna be heroes and then maybe, <laughs> just maybe, they'll wear it for us. If so facto, there's now an entire regiment of M4 Sherman tanks and armored cars full to the brim of fancy French lingerie and perfume headed to Belgium. Now at this point- Oh my God, this is, this is amazing. This is, this is nothing short of perfection. I'm, I'm dying from this. God, uh, I, I love the military so much. <laughs> <laughs> While everybody else is loading up lingerie and perfume, the chain of command is having a meeting because War Daddy and his tank crew just took out an entire train pretty much by themselves, including four German Tiger II tanks. So we need to get them some kind of award. So it, it becomes clear to the chain of command that these are probably the best tank crew that America has right now. Yeah. And they would do a better job of serving the country if they were sent back home yep. and sent on tour where they could tell their story yep. and help sell war bonds. And... Honestly, they've earned it at this point. So the chain of command then orders Poole to fall all the way back to the very rear and let everybody else handle everything from here on out. Fast forward two hours later, yeah. <laughs> whoever's spearheading the formation now comes up to this bridge and this bridge is the only way across this river and it's being guarded by three German Panthers. Right. And leadership has no idea how to cross this bridge. So leadership has another meeting and they're like, fuck, I guess let's fuck get War Daddy back up here. We need the main <laughs> character, bring him up. So all tanks, War Daddy. <laughs> when you're like, yeah, I guess I'll, uh, I guess, I guess I've been demoted from, uh, in the field to showboat status. And they're like, actually, we, we need to rescind that offer. We, we, uh, kind of need you to do this. This is, this, we, we have no idea how to actually get this done. We kind of need your plot armor. <laughs> like, that's gotta be some sort of just like satisfying whiplash. Daddy, 
Looks like I'm in. Poole gets the order. He pulls out of the formation, drives to the very front again. He's been gone for a whole two hours. He gets to the front, gets briefed on what's going on. He evaluates the situation. He looks off in the distance. There's this big hill on their side of the river. So he's right. like, okay, you guys stay here. I'm going to go handle this. So they go, they drive up to the top of this hill. He now has a good view of the rest of the river mm -hmm. and he can actually make out one of the German Panther tanks. He can't see the other two. He doesn't know how many are there. He just knows they're there. They're so well camouflaged, right. but he can see one of them. So he takes aim and he gets them ready. And he's like, we're going to, we're just going to rapid fire this entire thing. Uh -huh. He opens fire. And as soon as he fires, there's another round in by jailbird and they right. fire again and again and again and they take out this first panther tank and they do it so fast and they fire so many times that all the other tanks think that they're getting ambushed and they start <laughs> retreating there was only two tanks there oh, no. he sees them once they start moving but those tanks take off thinking that there's way more tanks than just one attacking them. Wow. Meanwhile, Poole's entire unit's kind of just sitting there like listening, hearing tank fire in the background, wondering what's happening. A few minutes later, Poole comes driving by again and just drives right across the bridge. <laughs> so everybody else is like, okay. And then they follow him and then problem solved. War Daddy saved the day yet again. At this point- That has that has such just like takes, takes, uh, takes drag off cigarette. <laughs> shifts rifle i'll take care of this it, it, but it, it's a 1v6 you can never do it i'll take care of this <laughs> but you also have like speed boosts on and you just you just clutch the 1v6 just like bam 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 double kill bam bam like oh my god did he actually just do that yeah yeah he did <laughs> straight up hold my beer status Poole's probably thinking to himself, like, okay, this is the point where I'm supposed to stop, get orders. They're probably going to send me to the back of the formation again. And he's like, but I don't want that. Because off in the distance, a couple miles ahead, he sees a German town. And he knows that that town is probably full of all types of important German supplies. Like because here. a second ago, they had three German Panther tanks trained on a single choke point. It was a pretty safe place to be. And yeah. he knows that if he can get there in a hurry, he can probably take out a bunch of more enemy objectives. So he just hauls ass straight <laughs> into this town right down Main Street, and sure enough, there's four German ammo trucks full oh, of German no. war supplies, and he takes out all four of them by himself as the rest of the unit is desperately trying to keep up. After a while, some of the other tanks finally catch up to Poole, but Poole keeps leading them deeper and further into enemy-held territory, and at dusk that night, they'd be ambushed by more Panther tanks, and that mm -hmm. ambush started by one of the Panther tanks shooting directly at In the Mood 2. Luckily, it was a glancing blow, mm -hmm. and everybody was okay. In the Mood turns, returns fire and scores a direct hit, knocking out the tank Wild. as the German crew bails out. But the tank didn't burst into flames yet, and that's not acceptable. So, In the Mood 2 <laughs> advances to shoot this tank again. As they hit it again, the whole thing blows up as In the Mood 2 gets hit again from another Panther tank. And again, it glances off the armor and everybody's okay. Mm -hmm. But they don't know where the hell it came from because it's so dark out, they can't actually see anything. So right. now they're just waiting and they're waiting and they're kind of moving back and forth and this panther tank fires at him again and they could see the muzzle flash the panther missed and in the mood starts returning fire just in that general direction firing blindly yeah. and after four or five rounds sent that way they see an enormous explosion <laughs> and flames as they had scored a direct hit on the enemy panther tank with so that that's literally like the dude sniping you in game right he just absolutely just trying to pot shot you but he keeps missing with the 50 cal and you're just trying you're just kind of it's like shifting a little back and forth, trying to poke your head out a little bit, try and bait it. He misses you with the 50 cal again, and you just <laughs> just bring out your LMG and just fire everything you have, or even uh, like your grenade launcher, and you just fire everything you have in that general direction. And then you, <laughs> and then you see the hit markers and the kill feed. <laughs> Oh, this is this is some spice. Pure luck. Any remaining German forces are forced to flee, and that was the end of that battle. They bed down for the night. They get some more gas in the tank. They get everything fixed. They eat some food, and the next morning they take off again, driving further into enemy-held territory. Mm -hmm. The next morning, War Daddy and In the Mood Two take off, hauling ass with the rest of the tanks. Pool figures that those two German Panthers ambushed them because they were trying to protect something, and he wants to find out what it was. Right, makes so, sense. He keeps charging deeper and deeper into enemy-held territory, and that's when he comes across 
dispatched an entire German supply convoy. Oh, no. And yet again, War Daddy and In The Mood proceed to turn this entire supply caravan into a shooting gallery. In The Mood alone is credited with destroying over a hundred vehicles, two German Panther tanks, two other tanks, three German 88 anti-tank guns, claiming over 50 enemies KIA, claiming 63 wow. as prisoners of war, and a ton of others wounded. When the smoke settles from this and the leadership gets to figure out what actually happened, it is decided that the In The Mood crew is all going to receive bronze stars and Lafayette Green Pool is going to receive the Distinguished Service Cross. He would also be nominated for the Medal of Honor, but that was rejected for some reason. Something to huh. do with uh, being in a tank is a team effort and he didn't do it by himself, so he doesn't deserve the Medal of Honor, which doesn't really make sense, but mm -hmm. it never does. So no. that happened. Now from here, it's pretty smooth sailing. They don't have much contact with I the German really military. They're pretty much just going from town to town, hanging out in a town at the end of every night. However, <laughs> In The Mood continues to be the number one spearhead of the entire division. And now, instead of being the first into contact, they're the first into every town. And that comes with its own unique set of rewards because as soon as American tanks start rolling in, all the people come running out as they start celebrating that the Americans are here to beat the Nazis. Mm -hmm. and they start showering them with gifts, cheeses, breads, fruits, eggs, and most importantly, booze. So in, yeah. in the mood gets first dibs on all the booze. booze. This pattern repeats itself day after day for a little while, and then they eventually come up on a bigger city called Leger in Belgium. Once there, they take the city pretty easily, capturing 1,500 German POWs, and then they've essentially freed the town, at which point all the townspeople come rushing out to thank the Americans, and surprise, surprise, this city is full of very attractive young Belgian women. <laughs> they start giving the soldiers <laughs> gifts like food and booze, and in exchange, the soldiers break out the fancy lingerie and perfume <laughs> they liberated from that train a couple of days ago and i want to just impress that they took that br they, they, they took that bridge blitz blitz the bridge got ambushed in that town and all the while they have just I, they just have all this lingerie in the back what absolute chads like i have i have nothing but respect for that <laughs> They start giving that back in exchange, and the entire thing turns into one gigantic block party that kind of ends up turning into a shit show because all the soldiers spread out as they start sleeping with all these young women, yeah. showing them that inches are in fact better than centimeters, Whoa. and everybody is just completely hammered. Which was fine, there was nothing wrong with that, right up until the next morning when the chain of command got the order to move out immediately. Oh. At which point the leadership, A, they're hungover, but B, they're kind of looking around and it's just like there's passed out people drunk all over the city, on yeah. the sidewalks, in the streets. It's chaos. The soldiers are all spread out because they all went home with different women. They don't know where like 75% <laughs> of their soldiers even are. <laughs> they radio back. They're like, we're going to... We're gonna need a couple of days to regroup. We yeah. had an issue. Yeah, we had an issue down here. So after that, we, they... we just had an interruption. We, 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 we you know, nothing to worry about. Just making sure that we all have our, uh, making sure that we have all our bearings together, making sure all our equipment is stable, making sure all our equipment is uh, ready for use, and we'll head out in a couple days. This is why I'm that friend that is always DD. This is why I'm that friend that always gets to talk for other people when they do stuff. Or at least I like that position because then I can make excuses like that. <laughs> well, and so and so and I'm not being a buzzkill with this. The other side of this actually, which is far interesting and just like where my brain tr tends to gravitate to in regards to military subterfuge is you especially liberating a city there could still be agents there could still be uh a, a, an enemy force present there is an inherent danger with you know going with just randoms like that and spreading out um there could be cells there there could be it, it could turn into a security situation really quick and suddenly you have a bunch of uh soldiers that are either missing or they are uh they, they unsubscribed to uh health care if that if you will <laughs> <laughs> and uh that work that it goes into like assassin work and that goes into uh deep subterfuge and stuff like that is that something you necessarily have to worry about no i think it's i feel like it's someone's job to worry about although i don't know whose job that would very would specifically fall to and that being said like i said like like well i think about these things well these are things that come to mind and cross my mind in regards to you know warfare you know in a war crime the first time it's you know at the end of the day, they did the job, right? They they, they ousted the, uh, the 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 German party with the end the end name that uh, I'm a little scared to say on YouTube. <laughs> they, and they they ousted them, and uh, you know, yeah, celebrations over. I'm not saying everything has to be oh this serious and rank and file, and you know everyone's got to be at attention at all times. One, I don't have any authority or ability to say that, and two, sometimes you just need to chill out. Sometimes you just need to get hammered. Sometimes you just need to. Uh... <laughs> 
<laughs> be spread out for a little bit in this capacity. You know, I'm not saying anything against that. Just things Kip gravitates to in regards to questions I ask, the whys, why could this be seen as a, a security risk issue, etc. Spend the next couple of days regrouping and yeah, getting regrouping. ready to move out yeah. again. After they get regrouped, it's off to the Siegfried line, the border of Germany, guarded by dragon's teeth, mines, machine gun positions, and barbed wire. They have to finally make their last push and break into Germany. On their way to the Siegfried line, Pools informed that him and his crew are not going to be allowed to spearhead this mission either, and they are to remain in the rear because him and his crew are still going to get sent home early so that they can sell war bonds and be heroes. Mm -hmm. Pool is also informed that they are going to be taking away his loader, Del Boggs, Jail bird is going to be sent all the way to the rear where he is going to have to undergo a vision and hearing exam oh no. for the next two weeks pretty much the entire duration of the rest of their time in theater before they get sent back home and the actual reason for this was because his brother had passed away in combat two weeks prior ah. and he was the last remaining son in his family and the commander did not want to have to tell that man's family that he died in combat two weeks before he was supposed to come gotcha. home so he was going to be sent all the way to the rear where he was going to stay until he could get sent back to america Mm. Bearing all this in mind, Poole agrees and he is going to remain in the rear of the formation and he's not going to be doing anything crazy. He is then assigned a brand new, fresh out of basic training, Private First Class Kenneth King to be the replacement loader for Jailbird, the best M4 loader in all of World oh, War II. No. Somehow a German tank snuck past the American line and managed to ambush Poole's section and the first tank they managed to shoot was in the mood. Poole immediately <laughs> orders his crew to return fire, which they do, but the shell wasn't effective against the Panther as he orders them to fire again, but Private First Class Kenneth King wasn't able to reload at the same yeah. pace that Jailbird was before him. So Poole orders Baby to throw it in reverse as he tries to get this kid more time to reload the gun. He ends up jamming the gun as the Panther fires Damn. another shell at In the Mood, and it punches through In the Mood and hits Private First Class Kenneth King directly in the head, killing him instantly. Wow. As Poole and Groundhog are both ejected from the tank severely wounded and the tank is still being thrown in reverse being manned by nobody except for baby and schoolboy driving blind they just continue to travel in reverse as another panther shell hits in the mood but glances off after about 30 yards they end up hitting a ditch and rolling the entire tank while that's going on pool who'd been ejected from the tank moments earlier looks down to see that one of his legs has been completely shredded by the shrapnel as Ow. he reaches into his pocket pulls out a morphine serrette basically a single one-time use dose of morphine injects himself before pulling out his pocket knife and attempting to remove what's left of his leg. The oh. nearby American tanks engage the German Panther, destroying it as a neighboring tank commander runs to Poole's aid. As Poole is yelling at him to go help the people in the tank, he doesn't. He runs up to Poole, injects him with another morphine serrette before calling medics to aid him. When the medics show up, they inject him with yet another wow. morphine serrette and Poole loses consciousness. The rest of the In the Mood crew survives and they end up ultimately getting reassigned to different tank crews where they remain for the rest of World War II. Pool, on the other hand, has to have his right leg amputated eight inches above the knee, and he is sent back home, where he spends the next 22 months in the hospital battling different infections, rehabbing, and getting fitted for a prosthetic. But That's unfortunate. And I, I really want to know the follow-up to this, actually. It's tragic, because... Jailbird had to have... There's, there's some survivor's guilt there. There's got to be. Like, that's awful. Like, it, it, just imagining being in a situation like that. And, well, they're going to get it. And the moment you leave, this, all that happens. That has, that's an awful feeling. And, oh, well, we're going to send them home and we're going to you know, use them to, uh, you know, we're going to parade them around to sell war bonds and stuff. And now that they've lost, I wonder if leadership cares. And that is a very, awful thing to think about because they did so much and it's not their fault it's 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 not they just had a new gunner that couldn't keep up with the pace their d for all intents and purposes in, in gaming terms their dps was significantly hampered right it's like you have a full round in an lmg you know full magazine of lmg and destiny and you empty it but you're getting no heavy ammo drops and you know you you're, you go into boss phase right and you have maybe half a mag by the time you get to boss phase you're not going to necessarily put as much dps as if you had a full magazine plus reserves or reconstruction on the lmg right the dps is just down and it just the fact that that tank even got there i wonder like i wonder how this was handled after the fact like because it snuck by the american line like it went through 
and that's what got it. So I wonder what leadership did after this. Time he's released from the hospital. It is 1946 in World War II. Oh, I guess over, that's fair. And he is then immediately discharged from the United States military because he now no longer has a leg. Lafayette Greenpool, AKA War Daddy, and his tank crew of In The Mood were in combat together for 81 days in World War II. And in that 81 days, they are credited with taking out 1,000 German soldiers, capturing 250 wow. more, destroying 275 armored vehicles, and 12 German tanks. For this, Poole had been nominated for the Medal of Honor twice. The first time, the paperwork had apparently been lost, and the second time, he was just flat out rejected. He was, however, awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, the Legion of Merit, a Purple Heart, the French Croix de Guerre, and the Belgian Fourier. After being released from the military, he went back home to Texas, where him and his wife started having kids, and he worked as a mechanic at a gas station for a number of years. And then, after a few years, the United States military came out with a special program where they would let people rejoin the military if they had special or desired talents, regardless of their physical disabilities, and Poole fit that bill. He was brought back into the military to serve as an advisor and to help train the next generation of tankers. He would do that from 1948 until retiring in 1960 as a warrant officer for. He then decides that his next life adventure is going to be to be a preacher, which he does for a number of years, which honestly makes sense because the dude is super good at putting people in touch with God. So yeah. <laughs> he does that for a little while and then he gets bored with that and he decides that he wants to give back and help the community. So he decides that he's going to be a teacher. He goes and he becomes a middle school shop teacher. And on the first day of any kid's shop class, he would always lecture them on the importance of safety and how dangerous power tools could be right before drilling a hole directly into his wooden prosthetic <laughs> leg. But the kids didn't know that at the time. <laughs> After that, he finally does truly retire. And in his retirement, he forms a relationship with the armored units out of Fort Hood. They bring him out there. They let him drive in an M1 Abrams tank for the first time. He's blown away at how much better they are than the tanks that he drove during World War II. They mm -hmm. also have him as the guest of honor at all their military events where he commonly gets to speak and he gets to know all the guys. And then in 1990, they're sent off to fight in Desert Storm. If you don't know, Desert Storm is considered to be the last great tank battles the world has ever seen. The last time that tanks were going toe to toe with one another on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. And the entire time that his guys were out there, Lafayette Poole was back home glued to the news, watching it every single moment of every single day. And as Desert Storm and by extension, tank versus tank warfare would come to a close, so would Lafayette Poole. His health began to decline and he would pass away at the age of 71 on May 30th, 1991, the very same day that he received word that his armored unit out of Fort Hood had made their way to Germany safely on their way back home to America because Desert Storm was over. Bringing a close not only to tank warfare as the world knew it, but the life of one of the greatest men to ever do it. So in conclusion, if this has taught us anything, yeah, never underestimate what you can accomplish by cheating on your next eye exam. Yeah. Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel I, is go buy some merch this. over at thefatelectrician.com. And don't forget to go check out War Thunder where you can play as in the mood yourself. Quack bang out. That's great. I love this. This was such an experience. Ugh, this I can hear all the weird German internet fanboys already. You know, the Germans actually had a tank commander that had like 100 enemy tank kills, blah, 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 blah. That's uh -huh. more than Lafayette Pool, blah. Yeah, you know what? Here's the deal. If you want to be MVP, your team has to win. <laughs> Secondly, quit simping over the German military. It's weird. Germans don't even do that. Grow up. Thanks for watching. Oh my God, yes. Oh. Oh, that's that was... That was priceless. Oh my God. That was nothing short of phenomenal. Thank you for that. Oh, that was so good. I I'm very happy that there was a not bad ending to that, if you will. It was tragic, absolutely. It was tragic that this had to even happen. It was tragic that, uh, you know, the tank got through. But I'm glad to see that it wasn't a story of, well, you're no longer useful to us. And, uh, you know, we, we have no, no need of, uh, somebody that, uh, cause it's for the longest time. Right. Uh, I think it was, was it politicians, foreign dignitaries and stuff like that. If you had some sort of disability or some sort of impairment, physical, right. Uh, I guess it was seen as less strong in a like macro foreign a policy front, I guess, um, you know, things like that. And, uh, I'm, I'm glad that he got the respect that he deserved and that, uh, for a number of years after he was a highly respected individual and, uh, he, he that is that, that you can look at him as an example of just healthy masculinity or what does this dude do? Right. 
He uh, he, he went after the military. He ta- he became a preacher for a little bit. He taught shop to middle schoolers, right, and always stressed the importance of safety and stuff. At the very least. Man has a lot more qualifications in regards to be a male role model than someone like Andrew Tater Sneeko, in my opinion. But uh, this is amazing. Bad Electrician, thank you for putting out this video. I uh, hope I didn't bog it down too much with some of my commentary because this video really deserves it. If you haven't seen the original video, I do know if there's people that come out and that haven't seen the Fat Electrician before, please go check out the Fat Electrician as well as the second channel, Fat Files. I'm not paid or anything to say this, right? I just think he puts out great content and content like this is what YouTube needs to be pushing more. We need more positive creators. We need more creators that are just down to earth, down and dirty. This is what you need to know. You know, we're going to teach you something today, something of value, something of substance. And, uh, uh, you know, as well as just having just, you know, that military appreciation, just uh, understanding history, history. I'm a huge proponent of it, huge advocate for understanding and learning from your history. And uh, I think I've ranted uh, long enough. Thank you, Fat Electrician, for allowing me to uh, react to such an amazing piece. I know this must have taken you a little bit of time, a lot of time. And uh, as always, I will give you the, uh, the give it the four days for the original to be out. I will, for those of you that may be new here, I give it four days between new uploads. So say if the Fat Electrician, Russian Badger, you know anyone else does a video, I will give it four calendar days. That way it can circulate in the algorithm. I do know that there's people that uh, will react to things hour one, day one. I apologize. I'm just not about that. I know that it hurts me metric, you know, with, uh, in the algorithm, it hurts me in metrics, but, uh, you know, I, I want to have a, a working respectful, uh, relationship and the understanding that if someone doesn't want their content reacted to, or if there's a problem or they want to reach out and talk to me, I do have that open line of communication and an open door policy for these creators. Thank you everyone. I definitely do appreciate that. Definitely go, uh, get up, stretch, get some food, get some water, all that fun stuff. We'll see you all in the next one.